if you're going to be successful in college, you need to know how to navigate around the university system. Most of you have spent at least a semester in college already. Some of you may have relatives or friends who've been to college and filled you in, perhaps told you what office you need to go to for help. And some of you might not have that type of resource person in your life. So just to make sure everyone understands the basics, we'll do a quick run through starting with what do you call your instructor? In elementary school or high school, it was easy. Everyone was your teacher. You called them Mr. Smith or Mrs. Jones, or maybe on a rare occasion there was a Dr. So-and-so, but it was pretty straightforward. At a university, there are different titles associated with different teachers. Most of the time, it has little impact on the quality of the instruction, and most instructors don't care what you call them as long as it isn't something derogatory or disrespectful. But to some professors, their title is important. They may feel that they worked very hard and sacrificed much to earn their doctoral degree, so they want to be called Dr. So-and-so. So here's a little background information to help you avoid any cultural faux pas. When a person has finished their PhD and they are first hired to teach at a university, they will start as an assistant professor. They typically are given about five or six years to prove themselves a good teacher and do quality research. Then they have to apply for tenure. If they put together a successful case proving their success and worthiness, then they are usually promoted to associate professor and granted tenure. Once a professor is granted tenure, it means that professor has job security. They can continue to teach at that university for as long as they want unless they do something really bad such as something illegal or if they are proven incompetent. Tenure was started in the, in the early 21st, 20th century to allow faculty to be able to teach how they wanted without being censored by others. Perhaps you heard of the term academic freedom? There was a point in time when professors had to be very careful about every word they said in the classroom because if someone did not like it or disagreed with their point of view, whether it was a university president or a major donor to the university, they were likely to find themselves fired. Once a faculty member has made it to the rank of associate professor and achieved tenure, a few more years down the road, when they've really established themselves as an expert in their field and as a quality instructor, they can apply for the rank of full professor. That might be a little more information than you wanted, but at least you have the background knowledge now. What you really want to know is, what am I supposed to call them? Highest rank is full professor, followed by associate and then assistant. Professors have multiple responsibilities, one of which is teaching. They are also responsible for conducting research in the area or, in case of an art professor, perhaps creating works of art and staying abreast of the latest information in their field. They also have to be involved in service, perhaps at the campus level by serving on committees or within the community by lending their expertise to community organizations. Continuing lecturers are people who have been hired for the primary purpose of teaching. They typically do not have as much expected of them in the way of research or service. A visiting professor is someone who is here temporarily for up to two years usually, and adjunct or associate faculty called LTLs here at IPFW are part-time instructors. These instructors can bring a different type of insight into the classroom if they are currently working in their field. For instance, an attorney who teaches business law or a CPA who teaches an accounting course. If your instructor has a PhD, then it is probably a good idea that you call them by the title doctor. You can look on the syllabus to see if they are listed as Dr. Smith or have a PhD behind their name. In some fields, such as the arts, they have other degrees that are terminal degrees rather than PhDs, such as an MFA, so 
Technically, these people are not doctors, though just as qualified. If you are ever not sure, professor is a safe thing to call your instructor, regardless of their degree or title. Professor is a term of respect used to address any instructor. Some professors prefer that you call them by their first name. That's okay as long as they invite it. Never call a professor by their first name unless they have told the class that it is okay or preferred. The university is a large organization with many different offices. As a taxpayer who's been paying into the state institution for a long time, you have a right to know how it's set up. As a student who will need to navigate your way through different offices for different services, it's imperative that you understand the fundamental structure. This is a very simplified org chart for IPFW. Of course, at the top is our Chancellor, Dr. Elsenbaumer. There are vice chancellors who report to him, and then associate vice chancellors, assistant vice chancellors, directors, and others who report to them. The primary reason that the university exists is to educate, and so at the top role for academics is the vice chancellor for academic affairs, Dr. Carl Drummond. He oversees all of the different colleges and schools. There are three areas that exist as support to the primary role of education. The Vice Chancellor for Financial Affairs, David Wesse, for example, sees some offices that you may never deal with, such as human resources, purchasing, accounting services. These offices keep the university functioning and make sure our bills are paid and financial resources are used wisely. You will, however, have interactions with the Bursar's office, who collects tuition and possibly student housing if you live there. The third area is under the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, Dr. Eric Norman, who is also called the Dean of Students. The offices in his area exist to provide services to you, the student, to help you be more successful and get the most out of your college career. This includes support services such as tutoring, services for students with disabilities, the Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs, and offices that enhance your experience such as student life and career services. This organizational chart is just the tip of the iceberg. This, this very organized chart is really all of the people of importance, leading up to the people who were on the previous slide. This chart doesn't even include all the administrative support positions, advisors, and people on the ground floor who also make things happen on a daily basis. In total, there are around 1,500 employees at IPFW, way too many to chart here. There are so many offices on campus that it is important to know where to go to find the help you need. Remember, if you are not sure where to go, your academic advisor is a great place to start. They can guide you to the people who can best help you in any particular situation. I could continue with this PowerPoint and bore you with information about various offices on campus, but we're going to make this a little more fun. We're going to have an online scavenger hunt. So when I get done here, you're going to have to go back to Blackboard and go into the quiz that's marked online scavenger hunt. You will have a series of questions with links to different websites for different offices, and you'll have to find the answer for that particular question. To make it a little more competitive, we're going to give five extra bonus points for the first 10 students to submit the quiz with all correct answers. Have fun!